How to rebuild a Stuart Models 5A steam engine. This is part 26. Slight modifications. As the engine's coming together and nearing completion, it's time to test the valve gear. I can't run it on steam yet because the valve gear isn't finished. I'm still waiting for the other eccentric to arrive. Anyway, there is a problem. And I'm a bit puzzled by this. When I look on the drawing, the general arrangement shows the reversing lever at 90 degrees to the drop arm. I even took the trouble to check the angle of the drop arm and the reversing lever on the drawing because the drawing is one to one. It's full size. And normally I do follow these drawings. I don't um, wing it, as one viewer put it. I follow the drawings. All the dimensions on the engine that I've been machining seem to be the same as the ones on the drawing. I do make slight modifications. The stainless steel wheel that clamps the reversing lever to the anchor link being an example of this. But that is of no consequence. Normally though, when I follow engineering drawings, I question them a lot. If I don't understand what's happening on the drawing, I generally will not machine the part until I do. But on this rebuild, for the first and possibly the last time, I followed the drawing to the letter. And the reason for blindly following the drawing was simple. I'm making a video for public viewing, and some of the viewers are incredibly meticulous and very picky, and will take every possible opportunity to criticise what I'm doing. For instance, in the last video, I used a piece of wood to position the casting in the forge or chuck, and immediately the critics were out. Well, aren't you worried that this piece of wood's going to fly out of the chuck and hit you on the head? Initially, I was going to try and be sarcastic, but I thought, well, there's just no point. The wood only weighs about three ounces. It's firmly held in place by the casting, and I don't think it's going to fly out of the chuck and hit me on the head any time soon. Some people just look for problems all the time. I generally don't. I always try to be positive and optimistic. Currently, it's 19 minutes past six in the morning, and I'm voicing over this video. It's Friday the 1st of September 2017, and I'm sat here in front of the microphone with several pieces of wood sticking out of my head at various angles. And sometimes it affects my speech like this. Anyway, that's enough of that. In this clip, I've frozen the image. This is with the lever dropped to the bottom. And the hole in the expansion link that connects to the eccentric rod is not fully in line with the valve rod. And when I lift the lever to the top, this one isn't in line either. In the workshop, I still have the twin 5A steam engine that I rebuilt for a customer a while back. And I do notice on that that the reversing lever and the drop arm are not at 90 degrees. So I think I'll duplicate that. And this problem will be eradicated forever. The mistake I made was to pin the reversing lever to the shaft too early. This part of the job needs to be done much later so that you can line up the valve gear first. It's a very easy fix though and nothing to worry about. When I bought the collection of parts for the existing engine, I did notice that these holes in the side of the cylinder that are to accommodate the drain cocks are far too big. I wasn't sure what the thread was. At first I thought there were probably 8 BSP. But when I tried some 8 BSP plugs in there, they were no good. I tried some taps in the holes to find out what the thread was. And the one that I found that fitted was 3 8 by 26. So in the lathe, I turned up a piece of steel to 3 8 of an inch in diameter. And I'm going to thread this 3 8 by 26 threads per inch. And I'm not using a tailstock die holder. I thought that just for a change, I would use a standard die holder to cut the thread and show how I use the tailstock chuck to initially engage the die and keep it square, as well as having the facility to follow the die all the way down with the tailstock chuck if I wanted to, which in this case I didn't. Once the die was engaged, it cut square all the way. As you saw at the beginning of this sequence, I did use some cutting lubricant for this. It's an old tin of cutting lubricant that I keep in a tin behind the lathe. And the next job is to make the internal thread. The first thing to do is face off the end, then I use a centre drill, followed by a 7 seconds of an inch twist drill, and I'm going to thread this quarter of an inch by 32 threads per inch. During the drilling part of this operation, the piece of steel was getting very hot, so I thought it would be a good idea to use some lubricant. And once again, I'm using some threading compound on the tap, which has now been introduced to the work. 
I initially turn it by hand and then I engage the lathe's back gear and put it on the slowest possible speed. You will notice that the chuck that I use in the tailstock, both on the Boxford and on my Smart and Brown lathe, is of the hand type. It doesn't need a chuck key to tighten it up. And they're really quick to use because you don't need a chuck key. But these type of chucks don't seem to grip the tools quite as well as a chuck key type. This can be quite a useful feature though. When you're tapping a thread with the tap held in the tailstock chuck, if the tap should grab in the work, the shank just spins round in the tailstock chuck. But if you're using a tailstock chuck that uses a key, then the tap is much more likely to break off because a tailstock chuck with a chuck key holds the tap far more securely. I've already shown the parting off of the first part of the thread, and now I quickly face across the front of the second part and part that off also. And in case you wonder why I'm using the handle of this pin chuck, it's just to stop this piece of thread from falling into the chip tray, where it may be lost forever. Because I've used cutting lubricant on these threads, they need to be degreased and cleaned up before I fit them into the engine. I'm using cellulose thinners for this, or lacquer thinner as it's called in the USA, and I'm also using the same stuff to degrease the threaded holes in the cylinder, and I'm being very careful not to let any of this run down the engine onto the nice new paint, because it will very effectively remove it. After the degreasing operation, the cellulose thinner soon evaporates, and then I can use some Loctite 542 to hold the inserts in place. I'm not using 603 because that would be too permanent, and it would be wholly impractical to heat up the cylinder with a blowtorch to remove them if ever I needed to. In my scrap box I found a piece of brass that was already threaded a quarter by 32 threads per inch. I made a brass nut to fit the threaded shaft, and I used this to screw in the inserts. And once each insert was in place, I simply undid the nut and removed the threaded rod leaving the inserts fixed in the cylinder like this. All I need to do now is just wait until the drain cocks arrive. A short while ago you may have been following the video when I rebuilt a Stuart twin launch engine. I've been running this engine on air to run it in, and it's running very smoothly at the moment, but I didn't have enough footage to make a full video, so I just thought I'd tag it on the end of this one. But that's it for now, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.